Okay, right, I think we'll go ahead and get things all kicked off. So good morning, everyone. And thank you very much for joining us for our WorkBuzz webinar today that we've got. Really interesting subject um, that I think all of us will have had frequent conversations about pretty much every year, but um, we all know it's a particularly hot topic at the moment. So our webinar on will pay make them stay or are there more important factors we have in store for you today? Um, so by way of quick introduction, I shall just introduce myself. So you're joined today by me, Nicole, um, a project manager here at WorkBuzz, and I work alongside our lovely John Backhouse, who's going to be presenting the session today. So a little bit about me. First of all, I've worked in employee experience for uh, about five years now, joined WorkBuzz, and I can't even tell you how many times I have the conversation around the pay question that we see so often in our surveys. Um, but in comparison, our lovely John um, has got a wealth of experience in this, I mean, every sector, but particularly in this question. So I shall hand you over to John to do a quick introduction to himself. Okay, thanks, Nicole. So lovely to meet you all virtually today. Um, I head up People Science at WorkBuzz. I joined about a year and a bit ago. I typically work with organisations to sort of front end their listening programmes to make sure we're immersed in their strategy and understand who they are to then ask the right questions in a survey and then get involved at the end in terms of all the results and understanding what those mean in terms of what do we need to take forward, what are the most impactful things, what will make the biggest tangible difference to their employees. So hopefully going to bring that experience to the table. I've been listening to employees for about 20, I think 26 years now. So I'm going to bring that experience to the table in how things might have changed over, over my career. But actually, I've, I've probably learned the most in the last sort of two years in, in facing COVID and re the move to remote working and how um, length of service perceptions have changed with people. There's so much that's changed in the last two years. I'm sure many of you out there will, might have that same as well in terms of how we've had to rapidly learn new things in a very short period of time. Thanks, John. So we'll just go over a couple of housekeeping bits to start with. So, nope. we've got a nice slide. so yes, thank you very much for taking the time out for your busy days. Um, it's a conversation that's always close to our heart. And the pay question is always something that we there's so much on the surface, but there's so much below the surface as well. Once you start getting an under the skin of those kind of conversations and how people are affected and how ultimately that affects your employee engagement. So I see that's what we are specialising in here at WorkBuzz. So just to let you know that the webinar today is being recorded. So for any of you that have joined um, and you might have colleagues that you might like to share this with afterwards, or if there's a particularly interesting point that you think I'd love to go and revisit that, you know, afterwards or back when you're having those conversations within your own organisations, the recording will be shared with you afterwards um, and will also be available on our YouTube after, so no need to worry there. Um, if you've got questions and we encourage them, please do use the Q&A button that you should see at the bottom of your screens. What we'll do is we'll collect all of your questions together and at the end of the presentation, we shall have our uh, best go at getting John to uh, go through and answer them. If there's many, don't worry, we should always go through and we'll make sure that we've got all of them answered, but we'll go through the key ones um, that we can today. So there's going to be polls through the presentation as well. We've got a couple of things, you know, make it a bit interactive, get people involved. So we'd love for you to participate in those. John will call out and you'll see them pop up on the screen uh, when we get into that area of the presentation. So, yeah, please get involved, ask us your questions and we will round back to those at the end. But for now, we're going to head into the, you know, will pay make you stay presentation. So something that's close to all of us and certainly a conversation that I'm sure will be ongoing has ever changed since COVID. So we'll go into the lay of the land as it is now. And I shall hand you over to John. Okay, thank you. So I just want to give a bit of context in, in terms of why we are here today and why we're talking about this particular topic. So. It probably started over, over COVID in leading us to this point because over COVID, lots of the headlines around the big shift around people potentially going to leave the organisation they work for. Some of the reasons cited out there were around homework and flexible working, etc. If that wasn't offered, then I'm going to move elsewhere. So there was a lot of scaremongering out there, certainly over COVID, around this big latent um, attrition issue might cost us in the UK around 17 billion. So that was probably sort of 19, 20, and 21. Um, 
based on the discussions I've had with many clients, that is real. So it wasn't just scaremongering. Lots of organisations have faced um, big attrition issues where that's hiked up compared to pre-COVID levels. For some, it's actually started to normalise now. Yes, it did hike up coming out of COVID and, and where we are now. And it started getting to a more normal pre-COVID level again. But for many, it's still increasing. But the big question then obviously is, is pay, is it, you know, can we just throw money at this problem and pay people more? Are they leaving because of pay? You know, why are they leaving? Is it just that or are the more important factors, hence the title of the discussion today? One thing to discuss as well, part of that context is, is the missing million. So Owen Estem tells, and I've done this kind of research for some of our clients looking into attrition levels and unemployment levels for their own region. So Owen Estem themselves have pointed to unemployment statistics don't always give the full story so of the 30 million or so not working during the period about 7 million said they didn't actually want a job and you can see from the graphic below that that, that, that hidden amount is actually growing over time so if we take a story from the Guardian pulling through some of those ONS data again they're saying the same thing because it is based on more ONS data in terms of unemployment rates hide that story so if you look at what's written below this graphic there's so many out there out of work and there's 8.7 of those people not captured in the unemployment rate and the class of just economically inactive by government statistics. And act actually that category is growing over time, this economically inactive group. People who are out of work who aren't always necessarily looking for a job. And if you have a look at some of the categories of the economically inactive it's students, long-term sick, looking after family, retired, et cetera. So, there's many reasons why people are out there and, and, and weirdly, actually, I was in those statistics um, for a period of time. So I, I left a, a role, um, I, I, I sort of finished there, I had enough money sort of to think about what I wanted to do next for a few, few months. I was actually embarrassed about saying, well, should I sign unemployed or should I just live off my savings for a short period of time? Probably affected us like that in lots of ways where people, if you are lucky enough to, to sort of think about your career differently, you don't then flag up on those unemployment statistics, me included at that period of time, whilst I was thinking about what I wanted to do next. So probably just had a big, big impact on, on us all. Um, there's many people out there who aren't fitting into that unemployed um, char characteristic and those statistics and who are under the radar. So if you take that a stage further as well, Actually, an article here is calling it the missing workforce. Could, he, could ease our labour crisis? So, you know, we're, we're, we're struggling in some instances to recruit people into our organisations. Um, is it Brexit? Is it that we've lost lots of people because of Brexit or not? Well, actually, if you look at this and take the grey bars from the second graphic there, 1.7, nearly 2 million people actually would like to find work if they had sufficient opportunities and support. So could that help us plug the gap where we're struggling for recruitment? There's loads of people out there, but we might not necessarily be able to get to them through the normal channels. And we need to really work hard and support them to bring them back into the work arena again. So that, that's been enlightening to me. As I said, I've been doing this a long, long time, thinking about unemployment rates in this way. And when I started looking at it for our clients as well, even down to a region, I would tell them, actually, you've got more econo economically inactive people in the region sat next to you. So you potentially need to start looking further afield outside your own regions to, to activate and maybe get some of those people over to work for you, especially if they can work remotely. So we did a state of engagement piece of research last year where we spoke to 300 different organisations and HR professionals and associated professions around the HR world, asking them what do they consider to be the most important factors for their existing and prospective employees. So it's really interesting to see where pay and, and pension benefits fit into that. So the big reveal. So from that research, they actually thought things like flexible working patterns, flexible working base, the ability to work hybrid, well-being, EDI, equality and diversity, personal growth were very, very important. You know, you can see the three top reasons around flexible working at that point in time. Remember, it was 2000, uh, 2021 when we did that research where, where many organisations were considering their hybrid working policies. So no surprise that those, thing, those things are up there. But salary and pension are relatively much, much smaller. And this is coming from HR professionals assessing what they feel to be important for perspective and their existing employees, remember. Oh, very, very far down that list. So it'd be really interesting to cross-reference that from the employees themselves to see how they feel pay stacks up. And a good place to start in asking that question 
do is from an employee survey. So an employee experience survey is an in-flight experience survey. There's lots of other surveys you can do at different points in the life cycle, pre-boarding, employee brand even before that, um, onboarding, orientation. So we're just talking about data from an employee experience survey, which is an in-flight experience. And in the questions that we ask, we ask a question around intention to stay in the organization. And if people say, I don't intend to be around for the next 12 months, we then say, well, what are the reasons for that? So it's actually the stated reasons for intending to leave or maybe not even intending to stay, whichever way we want, we want to look at it. So no surprise when we ask employees who don't intend to be around for sort of the next 12 months and intend to leave the organization, that pay is the biggest reason why they're thinking about leaving an organization. Now, there's some, this is a very anecdotal thing. Intention to leave, it doesn't always mean you're actually going to leave. So if you want to affect something in a survey, you, you would be clever and within your rights to say, actually, even though I don't intend to leave, um, I might just say that and I might put the thing on the top of the list that I really want you to focus on to pay me more. So there is a little bit of gamesmanship when you look at employee surveys in the in-flight experience where employees know the game and sometimes play that game. And that's why when we get into some of the more data, we'll see how to cut through people playing the game and look at it from many different angles to tell us the real story about the actual people who leave our organisations and how they were feeling differently. So pay's up there, recognition is up there, career, well-being, again, in my career over time, didn't used to be on the radar, really. So well-being is an issue with making you feel like you might want to leave an organisation has increased and increased and increased, and certainly over COVID, um, the, the main thing coming out of many of our surveys is around people feeling worn out, having to work harder, having to pick up the pieces, pick up the work of colleagues that have gone on pandemics and gone off sick and all the rest of it. So we have at the moment been a very tired workforce in most organisations. So there's no surprise that well-being is a reason for intending to leave is up there in the list in sort of the top five. Now, there's a whole load of other things in there. And as I said, this is just looking at the in-flight experience and people might be playing the game or it might be genuine. And obviously, with the energy price increases, then, then for some people, pay is a real dilemma for them. And, and I've even talked to organisations that are almost running internal food banks and having to sort of their employees, certainly the lower paid employees might be living on the breadline in some instances where, where that is a real issue for them and might be increasingly so. So that's just one angle. And, and pay will always be there on the survey. And whether, whether you look at the scores across all the different themes as well, not just intention to leave, pay is generally one of the lowest scoring areas. I don't think I've ever done an employee survey in my whole career where somebody said, pay me less. But it'll always be there, but it's just then dissecting it to see if it's a real issue for us. So one of the first polls we want to ask, so we're talking about the in-flight experience, might not give us the whole story. We need to look at different angles. We need to look at joins. We need to look at exits. So I'm just going to launch a poll now just asking, do you use employee lifecycle surveys to help us then dissect away from people gaming the system or just looking at it to evidence it from different angles? Let's launch that now. It's a simple poll for yes and no. Let me give a few seconds. that data to come in. I think this poll's especially interesting, isn't it, John? Because we always talk about the frequency at which you do your surveys and how often you do your employee listening, because listening is so incredibly key. It's the first step to any you know success story, isn't it? Very much so, very much so. Really interesting stuff coming in. So it looks like it's most people have voted, so yes. 44% no, 56%. Well, maybe some of the things that we're going to go through in a short while might convince you otherwise on the importance of, of putting those kind of things in place. Let me just end that poll. Okay. Right, so. Just to gonna stall, I can see on my screen you can't see. Someone has raised their hand. Nicole, are we saving questions to the end? Yeah, we'll circle back to questions at the end. I can see Rebecca's got a hand up as well at the moment, which is another work buzzer. But yeah, we've um, got questions. So use the QA section, guys, and it'll keep us to time and we can round back and do them all in one fell swoop at the end for you. Okay. 
great stuff. So just showing the importance of looking from different angles at the data. So what I've done here is pulling some data from annual colleague survey on the intended reason to leave. So people who said I don't intend to be around and then I was asking, well, why that might be the case. And it's covering some of the things we've just seen previously. So 46% said it's about recognition. I don't feel appreciated. 25 on well-being, and 52%, and as we saw from the previous slide, you know, it's very high pays generally the, the main reason why people say I don't intend to stay around. When you actually then look at leave survey data, so this is people actually leave. So recognition is still on there. So people are still saying that's important to me. Well-being is still equally important. So it was a reason, as I said, that's been a growing reason over the last couple of years. And it's still important, whether it's in the in-flight experience being picked up or whether it's in the exit stage being picked up in a survey there. But pay, so very high in the annual survey, halves as a reason in, in the benchmarking that I pulled together for this one. So again, remember me saying game in the system. Yes, it might be real for some people, but by the time people actually leave, real people leave in an organisation, pay is still on the list, but it's not as important as some of the other factors. So we'll get into that in a bit more detail. So just hold that, just look at the change on pay there. So yes, it's still on the list, but it's not as important as it was as a factor for leaving. Now, one of the conversations I've been having with organisations um, on this very same topic is, is it pay or is it what you now need to do for your pay that's changing? So as I said, people are being stretched, being asked to do more over COVID, picking up on under pandemics and everything else that's going on. So is the pay now correct for all that additional work and all that stress and strain and things that you've had to go through? It is the conversation that I have been having with them. Now, there's some funky building going on here because I've hit the results here. So what we've done is, is we've taken survey results between stated reasons for leaving whilst they were working for an organisation and then taken those same people who left the organisation to see how their views differed between those two points. So the previous slide was just an amalgamation of everybody. Now we're looking just at people who actually left an organisation and how their views changed between their their perceptions in the in-flight experience when we surveyed them in an annual survey or, or similar, and then in terms of their leavers survey. So recognition, don't feel appreciated or valued. By the time those same people had left, so this the same recognition was, was high on my list. Yes, it's still high on my list, but it's not as high as it was potentially. Well-being is higher on my list now, so it's a real reason why I'm actually leaving. I felt it was a reason to make me think I want to leave, but when I actually left, yes, it's still a reason and it's more important. Like the previous one, yes, pay is still on the list, we can't discount it, but it's not as important as well-being and just generally make me feel valued and appreciated. My career, I don't have opportunity to go or advance, which picked up in the main survey and is still a reason at the time of people leaving an organisation. Line manager is often touted out there if you read any study as a reason for leaving organisations. It wasn't a reason in the in-flight experience, but the time it came to actually leaving the organisation, it had nearly doubled um, in terms of its size of a reason for leaving. And then in terms of that flexibility and work-life balance, um, it's increased slightly. But if you actually look at the size of the percentages, um, recognition and well-being are the two biggest factors just generally make me feel valued and appreciated and in terms of job, job negatively affecting my well-being or the big takeouts of people who are actually leaving. So as I said previously and while we asked the poll on life cycle surveys as well is we can't just go on the information taken from an in-flight experience survey in terms of the possible re reasons we need to look at it from a multifaceted angle to make up our minds and dissect it that way. Okay, so looking at it from a different angle again to try and drive home the same message, message, I guess. So again, we looked at the differences in opinion of people from an employee survey between those who actually left or stayed. So we looked back in time for all those people who left an organisation and, and, and looked at how did they potentially answer some of the questions in an in-flight experience survey differently from those who ended up staying in the organisation? So is it going to tell us the same things again? 
And these are the questions where there was the biggest difference in opinion between those who actually left the business. And remember, not everybody leaving the business completes an exit survey. And then not everybody completing an exit survey may necessarily tell you the truth because they might not want to burn the bridges with your organization, but they will certainly point us in the right direction. Hence why we can't just rely on one piece of information to make our minds up on, on why somebody might have left an organization. So makes good use of my skills was the biggest difference um, in perception, 19 percentage points lower for those who actually left the business on the perception on that particular item. I have the opportunity to develop new skills, 18 percentage points different. I have the opportunity to contribute to decisions that affect my role. So this whole um, thing around empowerment, decision-making is, is very different in the perceptions of those that actually left us. We're almost looking at potentially the hidden story reasons that they might not always talk about these things. Although we have, as you've seen, picked on things around career in, in the information so far. How just having a generally good environment to, to work in is, is high upon the difference between somebody who stayed and left our organization. So a good environment to work in is, is typically, you know, the physical working environment and to some extent the culture as well. Career again, so that's linked to the first two items on developing new skills and making good use of my existing skills. And then finally, my area is well led around leadership. So not just your direct manager always talking about maybe the next level up of leadership. So we've reinforced probably some of the factors that we've seen previously. Yes, career was a stated reason by employees themselves. When people actually come to a leaver survey, career is still up there, although it has changed. So we're reinforcing that career development skills and growth are vitally important, whichever direction we look at. We've, we've brought in a couple of new ones here though around empowerment, um, and, and around whether your area is well led in leadership. So we've got lots of different factors, but we've only got to those by looking at surveys in different ways. And we're almost building a picture now of whether it's hidden reasons or stated reasons, whether it's in a leader survey or, or not, in, in terms of what somebody leaving us might tick the boxes and red flag if they start ticking all of these boxes around growth, around not feeling I have a say at work around my perception of leadership. Now, if we start red flagging people, we start now looking at different angles and knowing why people are leaving us. If you're only doing an annual survey, when those red flags get hit, it might be far too late. And if you're not obviously not doing life cycle surveys and, and looking at data in a completely different way, you might not be picking up on the hidden reasons either. So. The only way we can do something about um, this is, is by literally looking more frequently at surveying people so we can actually then action these things more in real time. So I just want to ask a question at this point. We've already done the life cycle thing, but just generally in terms of the in-flight experience, how often do you survey your, your team or even your organisation? So let me just launch that poll. And we'll give it a minute or so for you to answer. This frequency of when we survey, John, has been a conversation we've been having loads over the past couple of months, hasn't it? Yes, yes. And, and it's a really difficult one because the, the kickback to moving away from a less frequent survey is, is how quickly we can then take action. And people are scared that if we're doing surveys more regularly that we just won't be able to keep up with taking actions off the back of those surveys. But then it gets into, well, shouldn't we be more focused in what questions we're asking in those pull surveys? It's almost reinforcing things we already know. So mm. in this example, it might be building a survey just on the items that we know are red flags for attrition. So if anybody hits those markers, the action is then to identify um, remedial action very quickly in the areas where, they, where they're hitting all those markers. Yeah, absolutely. And I know that we've had a lot of conversations around actions speaking such huge volumes. So actually, you're taking action on what your employees are telling you and making all those important things you know the safety making sure you've got the tools to do your work and work at your best it's so so important but also it kind of dissipates pay a slight little bit doesn't it it does yeah and the, the, there is still a place for an annual or a big survey is a big i always say in in terms of you know a big health check you go to the doctors and and say you know check 
by my knees and my elbows and everything else, check everything. And then when we've identified you've got a tennis elbow, then we can focus just on the tennis elbow and fix that for you. But to get to that point, sometimes you need to do that big diagnostic first. Then after that, I'm just going to focus in on your elbow and how that's getting better over time. And that's, that's almost a pull survey in a nutshell. You know, use the big diagnostic as a big health check and then use those pull surveys once we know what the issues are to then focus on progress against those issues as a very quick um, summary. A tennis elbow, by the way. That's why I'm using that as an example. Perfect. Interesting responses on the, uh, sir, on the poll. Okay, and this has changed over time. So in our state of engagement, we actually asked this as well. Um, there has been a move over my career, definitely from like surveyed every two years to every one year to every half year. So there is a move towards more frequent surveying. And, and the poll so far is annually 36%, over 36%, quarterly 29%, and monthly zero. It looks like all the answers are in. I'll just end the poll there. So thank you for that. Okay. Now this is a stage that many organizations could do and could work, work in in terms of building the, the case study for, for all of this together. So if you do a survey and you've just said you, you do and, and that's annual, quarterly or other um, by and large, so you can start piecing stuff together to then say the impact of attrition on organizations and then what things are linked when you put it together. So each dot is, is say a different part of an organization. This is turnover, rolling turnover, and this is the engagement score. So when you start doing this, you can often see a straight line fit, fit between whatever metric it is. And this is turnover versus that engagement score. There is a relationship between those two things. So engagement, as we've already seen, um, before is, is very much linked from the in-flight experience. People tell us why they're leaving. We start then adding all the, the pieces together from a slightly different angle as well, looking at engagement and the drivers, and are they the same drivers of engagement as efficient? So you could do this yourselves if you hold this information and start piecing it together. Now, unfortunately, and, and this is a learning, and, and you maybe you already know this, but sometimes when you're looking at employee surveys, they end up being a very HR thing. And it goes about, you know, making people happy at work. And, and, and this is a really throwaway statement, but this is just the learning again over time is that leaders are often cost-benefit analysis machines. So if you want to make a change based off employee, employee results, often we have to put it in the terms of a cost-benefit analysis machine and, and show the actual impact of an organisation in, in numbers terms and start piecing it with other performance metrics to, to really make leaders sit up and take notice and take it away from the discussion of it being a happiness survey to it being a business diagnostic or an organization improvement diagnostic. Now, one really startling thing is that's just one point in time looking at turnover versus engagement score. If we then look at, well, does one thing go up cause the other thing to go down or vice versa? So where we look longitudinally at information, where the engagement score dropped from one survey to the next, turnover was three times more likely to increase than decrease. Now, it's not a perfect world. It won't always be one thing going down and the other thing going up. But it's very strong evidence that engagement going down leads to, leads to attrition going up or turnover going up. So that's the kind of terms, unfortunately, where many leaders then start sitting up and taking notice of employee surveys and it moves away from being a HR thing or a tick box exercise. Now, one thing we do in our surveys to cut through all the noise of all the different questions and different themes, so what I'm trying to do then is try and reference back into the, not just the intention to leave reasons, but just the actual full employee survey and the analysis tell us any other factors or re-evidence the factors we've already established, whether it's hidden or not. So what we do in our employee surveys is we take all the themes from the survey and we basically just the average scores for each theme and then plot them on a, on a quad plot. The higher something appears, the happier people are with that survey. And that's what they told us in those surveys, the lower, the less happy. From left to right, the further to the right something appears, the greater the impact on that theme, that theme is having on engagement. Now, what I've actually done is I went back to the last 10 presentations I've given to executive teams and I just pieced it all together and to give you a master view or a combined view across all those presentations. 
I tell you what, as I said, I've learned a lot in the last two years, but I've learned a lot in the last couple of weeks in piecing this together because it was absolutely unbelievably startling when you looked across these presentations and there were very different organisations. There was manufacturing companies, there were care companies, there were insurance and finance companies. You couldn't have got more different organisations um, in, in, in building this view. And it was unbelievably startling how close each of them were when we looked at the thematic factors driving engagement across. So I'm going to piece it together bit by bit. In terms of the common factors, in terms of areas to celebrate a leverage where people are relatively happy with these items, but because they're further to the right on here, they, they are, in our analysis, more strongly linked to impacting on engagement levels. In terms of areas to maintain, so people are relatively happy with these items, but they're not quite as impactful on engagement, so local level teamwork, customer centricity and, and the immediate manager. Then we've got a cluster of reasons all sat between monitor and improve. Empowerment, growth, well-being and recognition. So does that look familiar to anybody? So this is picked up in the in-flight experience, in fact, just driving engagement. Does that look familiar to anyone? Because it does to me, because everything that I've just shown you has picked out those exact same things from multiple different angles, whether it's hidden reasons, whether it's reasons in a leave survey, whether it's stated reasons from an annual survey. And we're just talking about engagement here. It's nothing, nothing to do with attrition. It's just purely analysis on what's driving engagement on our say, stay, strive, strive model, which are things like pride, advocacy and motivation. So a startlingly close picture on the main factors which sit around that monitor and certainly that improved box. Pay. So to an item across all of those surveys where I combine this together, pay is way to the left. So yes, the satisfaction with pay is one of the one of the least satisfied themes of our employee experience, but in terms of its impact and engagement, it's way, way off to the left. So remember one of the first graphics, how pay as a stated reason was very high, but actually at the time of leaving, it was much lower. So will throwing money at pay change this factor or should we actually be focusing on recognition, well-being, growth and empowerment? Because they will be far more impactful, not only on engagement, but also on potentially lowering attrition. It's the same reasons, whichever way we look at it. Now, one other factor on here, and this was probably one, if not the most startling thing of all of this piecing it together, was leadership. Now, leadership as an item for me over my career didn't used to be in that bottom right hand quadrant it slowly moved over there but over the last year and two years leadership as an item is massively as a standout thing over to the right in terms of it's often relatively speaking has the lowest level of satisfaction for employees but relatively speaking one of the highest impactful things we can do for engagement the whole thing around leadership has changed over the last couple of years and that may be explained why that's moved over leaders themselves it's now a completely different skill set that it used to be in terms of delivering your role as a leader in a remote workforce. There's so much has changed around the world of leadership. In terms of the state stated, you can read any article out there, but the, the, the facet of a successful leader around empathy, around integrity, around transparency, very, very different nowadays. And, and maybe leaders themselves have struggled to move into that new world and, and move into being a leader um, in a dynamic organisation that's changing so quickly. Um, even on hybrid working, I mean, you used to have discussion after discussion after discussion with leadership teams where employees pre-COVID, way before COVID, employees were saying, well, why can't we work flexibly and in a hybrid way? And leaders were saying, we haven't got the technology to collaborate um, and we just haven't got the technology in place full stop to allow people to work, work at home. But suddenly that had to change, didn't it, over COVID? So where, you know, the technology was there, we could still collaborate to some extent remotely. Those two reasons were taken away very quickly. And organisations have had to massively re-engineer themselves to face a new world moving forward. Now, a lot of the things that come out of employee surveys, people are looking at the leadership to help us with as well. It's a worrying time, obviously, for us all in an organisation and how it's changing. So leadership is far, far more on the radar as a reason to fix. Now, there's, a, there's another story here because it leads us then into all this information and what we do with this information, which is a stumbling point for many organisations. 
So I like the analogy of the iceberg and I've been using this more and more. Um, I know it's been used in lots of other ways for, for change and organisation change, but I'm just using it from an employee survey perspective, whether it's joining surveys, in-flight experience surveys. So pay, yes, it's an item, it's on there. It's not as important at the time of leaving as, as it was in the in-flight experience. You can see in terms of a driving factor of engagement. So actually to me, to think of above the waterline Now, when we take some of the other items, though, that are coming as vitally important and, and the kind of discussions you might be having in your organisations as well. So leadership and well-being, let's just use two as an example. Now, I'm not picking on any particular organisation. I'm just showing what happens typically with an employee survey and how the data is used. So leadership, the survey says leadership's in the bottom right-hand quadrant. So the organisation then looks at things potentially above the waterline, which might be a bit more superficial or they might be reasonably good things to work on. So an example might be leadership's an issue. Let's fix it by we're going to start sending a weekly CO email. We're going to get leaders walking around and visiting a few sites. So that's things above the line. You need to think about the root causes on some of these things. So I know I'm jumping a little bit about away from pay, but pay, it's often the outcome of other things that sit below the waterline, like what I have to do for that pay, like well-being issues um, and demands on, on me. So that's just an example. Um, and using leadership, the things below the waterline, if you really want to be brave, fix leadership as an item, you need to start looking at things like, and, and again, these are just examples, the whole thing around leadership capability, especially where leaders now have to lead a remote workforce completely devolved decision-making. This is a common one as a root cause of why leadership appears in that bottom right-hand quadrant. Creating a charter of and then enforcing those correct leadership behaviours. Having absolute clarity of roles, responsibilities, accountability and authority. And this is a real common one where you find leadership in that bottom right-hand quadrant. You often then find confusion certainly even or even between leaders themselves and those top few tiers of leadership around who's picking up what and often leaders look at the same problem but aren't quite sure who's actually accountable or responsible for fixing that problem and here's a big one and I'm not picking on anyone in particular but an employee survey might highlight something like the need for a really big change which might be appointing a completely different person into that board at the very top level or even changing a CEO and look at the title only the brave dive beneath the surface so employees surveys where engagement levels go down and often attrition levels go up and say leadership is being flagged as an item engagement might continue to go down if leadership is that big driving factor if we don't go beneath the surface and get brave about some of the actions we need to take and, and if we just play around with the things above the surface it won't change things tangibly for people. Now on wellbeing, mental health first aiders, manager training on wellbeing, so wellbeing comes out as an item. Is, is that fixing the root causes or is that applying sticking plasters? So mental health first aiders, will that actually change the reason why people are having wellbeing issues or will it help address um, the things above the surface? Manager training on wellbeing the same. Just as an aside on managers, they are often the ones who flag in surveys, they've got the most issues with wellbeing themselves because they're having to pick up the day-to-day -day job as well as keep delivering as a people manager. So managers are feeling it the worst. So where would they have time to do that training or apply that training or spot wellbeing issues in other people? Now, under the surface, if we're looking at wellbeing, we're looking at the root causes. So it might be a complete overhaul of the organization design. It might need, we need huge investment to create frictionless working and get rid of all those frustrations in the day-to-day -day job. It might be we need class leading holiday and other people policies around that or pay breaks for, for say, people who don't get pay breaks at the moment to help them have those, those breaks. It might be making hybrid work for those who can and offer financial hours benefits to those who can't take hybrid. So there's a difference in them, say, the manufacturing world, whether the people on the shop floor can't work hybrid. So can we change their shifts and give them, give them more well-being? Um, opportunities and choosing the right people as managers and then making that the focus of their job that they are a people manager first and we want you to devote most of your time to inspiring teams and having those career conversations and whatever else so if you wind back to the reasons for people actually leaving well-being career recognition 
empowerment to some extent. So if a people manager could be a people manager and have those career discussions and do those other things, would that affect those things? And you saw the reason for the immediate manager um, changing was, was a reason, sorry, and a, a more important reason for leaving at the time of leaving in terms of the relationship you have with them. So as I said, all of this is pointed to how brave do you want to be with this data. So survey frequency is really important, but when you're looking at stuff, the factors driving engagement are very similar to the factors driving attrition. Pay is on the list, but it's not as important as all the other things making me say, well, what do I now have to do for that pay? I'm worn out. Now, here's a completely different way of looking. So boomerang employees is the grass really greener. So if we look at people who came back to an organisation, this is another thing you need to take into the equation as a completely different angle to look at this. Where people go away, and this is a group of people who went away and came back to an organisation. So we know pay was a possible reason. We know leadership was a possible reason driving engagement, driving up attrition. Where they actually came back to us, our boomerang employees who'd gone away and then came back were far more positive to the things that we've already listed and talked about so far. And it's disappointing that people have to go away to see that. Now I've seen this time and time again, um, especially for longer serving people, they sort of lose touch with the rest of the world and, and have very long memories and talk about the good old days and things like that. And then somebody might get a shock if they moved outside our own organisation. So just as a different angle, when we're looking at attrition and retention, just think about actually, is the grass greener? How can we convince people it might not always be green? I'm not excusing away things that we really need to fix. And I said, we already need to be brave. But if we do have boomerang employees, could we leverage them to maybe speak for the people? Actually, I thought, you know, pay was going to be better, but God, I have to do even, it's even worse there. What I have to do for the pay there, I might get paid more, but it's far more stressful than it's here. And I thought we didn't have empowerment here, but it's, it's way worse when we moved there. I didn't have a say in anything. In all those conversations, how can we leverage that and understand? So, again, it's looking at it from many different points. Don't just make a mind up from the in-flight experience, because yes, there are factors there and engagement does point to those things, but reinforce it from different angles. Now, one thing again is, is backed up by my own learning is, is a really important point to consider before we summer, um, give a summary of everything we've talked about. And this is the changing viewpoint on people's careers and how you view how long you want to stay in an organisation. And I've seen this change over time. I've had instances of it myself in my own conversations with people and my own career as well. But it's, it's far more marked nowadays. So we'll have a look at some of the stats here. So age 16 to 24, the average length of time spent in a job is about two years. For those 25 to 40, that's nearly three years. Gen Z's 41 to 56 an average of five years, and then baby boomers spend eight years. So it goes from two to three to five to eight across the different generations. And if you look at some of the factors, this was taken from a Yahoo Finance article pulling in lots of different things. Uh, Gen Z, it's about you only live once, so you, you do want better pay and benefits, but you also want experiences, and sometimes that pays to pay for those experiences as well. So you want better experiences and learning and career progression, and sometimes the pay and benefits is, is also to pay for those things outside of work. And I even had that conversation yesterday with somebody saying exactly that. Um, and and it, it gets me back as well. I used to do to survey for um, the military and younger people joined because it was all about excitement. I did apprentice, um, not apprentice, sorry, like joiners, people who just joined and pre-joined and then how their views changed over time. So at the start, it was all about the excitement, the training, going on de deployment. But as you got older and had a family, you hated going on deployment compared to previously and your families hated you going on deployment. And the main reason for leaving was because your family said, I can't take this anymore. You've been away from home so much. So do we look differently and start segmenting our employees in a different way and, and looking, looking at what people want at different life stages and treat them like we do customers more? But that's a, bit, a big awakening and increasing information coming around that. So key takeouts is intention to leave doesn't always mean you will. But thinking like you may want to leave might affect you. So if you're still staying, but you feel like you're going to leave, then why are you there? Because you might be infecting other people and you're not happy. Almost always pay will be a high reason for them to leave in an in-flight experience survey, as will lack of growth and not feeling valued and well-being. 
but by exit pays much lower as a stated factor and career appreciation still remain on the list, but well-being, flexibility in your, in your role in terms of hybrid and, and hours and the relationship with the manager will dial up. Hidden reasons then cross-check the importance of growth, but add in empowerment and enablement around the environment and the leadership. So we might not necessarily pick up on those facts in just the pure stated reasons. Engagement is related to attrition, and when it goes down, attrition is three times more likely to increase. And in employee survey analysis, highlights the same factors, really. So we can take a lot out just the in-flight experience, not just the stated reasons, looking at the drivers of engagement, because they're very similar. And then evidence in all of this allows us to red flag employees hitting these markers. So if we're doing frequent surveys and we know it's growth, we know it's well-being, we know it's flexibility, we know it's relationship with manager and these other things, we could do a pull survey just on those things, a very short survey, and suddenly anybody ticking those red markers would say, hang on a sec, that team, team A has a lot of people hitting those markers. We need to do something about that very quickly because you know, we've actually got a big latent nutrition issue about to happen. And then finally, two, two learnings is let's also use boomerangers, if that's even a term. Is that a new term I've made up? I don't know. But the grass may not always be greener, even though we're thinking badly. And, and a lot of my presentations have actually been around don't kick yourselves. You know, lots of people are feeling like this elsewhere as well, you know, thinking the grass is greener, leaving. So let's think about the people who come back. And then this one to three year churn might be a new normal. So again, don't kick ourselves if we're losing people. Um, within like two or three years it might be that that's just the type of people and that's how they think about their own careers so can they have a really good time while they work with us can we make the onboarding really efficient can we make the exit really efficient and can they leave us as a hero they might go somewhere else for three years somewhere else for three years and they might come back as a leader of our organization in five or ten years time thinking what a great place out of all the places I've moved to that place was the best I'm going to go back there now when I want to settle down and have a family I'm a high talent person I remember that was my best part of my career I'm now going to settle down in that organization so the, the the whole summary is don't look at just one data point look at it from lots of different angles although there's clues throughout the life cycle that we can pick up along the way so that's that's it from from myself perfect okay then yeah so thanks for that John so obviously really interesting key takeouts there which is around you know pay is one factor but there's so many more things that can feed into your experience that will build your loyalty towards an organization and it will ultimately impact on you know how you view your working life um but so interesting that point around the generational difference of you know sometimes attrition it's out of our control it's it's a big shift within the industry at the moment so really interesting there John thank you for that and um, so I know we're slightly out of time, but we're going to jump into questions. So anyone that wants to stick around for those, we shall do my favourite bit, which is putting John on the spot. So we've had a couple of questions come in through the Q&A. So one of them um, is asking John, so talking around the life cycle surveys, so pulses, but also leaders and onboarding, um, saying, you know, we presume that we need to survey at intervals. So can you just comment on sort of that? life cycle piece joining the dots together and how best to survey to get the good uh, quality data yes yeah, so the, the answer is it's different for, for different people so um not only is it a technology thing in terms of the technology in place to do those things and link them up in, in a dashboard um, and do some of the things i've shown you here in terms of looking at the different points and hidden stories behind it's a cultural journey of your organization. So I can't really give an exact answer as an ideal because it depends on where you are on your cultural maturity. Um, you need to take people along that parallel journey with the actual technology being in place as, as well. Um, and one factor underpinning a lot of this is, you know, what have you done with your previous data? Because um, one of the biggest cultural journeys is actually taking action off the back of a, a survey. If people don't believe action has been taken off, say, a standard annual survey, then we've got a much harder challenge in convincing people to take more regular surveys. So there's a whole cultural journey we need to sit down with an organisation and, and work out. But in an ideal world, if there was such thing as an ideal world, you, you would be doing surveys at least on the sort of the, the first sort of three months to six months of a person's career, sort of an onboarding um, then maybe sort of every um, every year is a big annual survey, is a health check, and, and then maybe every quarter is a pulse, focusing on those, those key items found in that big health check, and then exit surveying 
um, ideally just before a person leaves an organization because because they don't have the same loyalty once they've left you know what's in it then to complete it maybe as part of the offboarding process say you know the very last minute when you're handing your equipment back please complete that exit survey we're just going to sit you down as part of that thing and, and just you know get you to fill that survey in in now at that point before you go as a captive audience um, so that would be the most basic ideal world. And then out from there, there are other elements as well, but it's down to the cultural maturity um, parallel journey as well. Yeah, so it's almost about embedding that as part of your core culture, isn't it? You know, that listening, the frequency and not letting it be too long until you've almost lost the audience that were telling you back then, hey, we've got a problem. It's about making sure you're doing those check-in points. Perfect. OK, and then um, we'll just do one or two more. So saying about we've got uh, Rebecca saying it's been interesting insights and as a part of their organisation they've actually developed a suite um, of supporting materials so profession continuing professional development modules financial health checks those kind of things which they see are often missing in the workplace so they're almost putting together a toolkit then for their employees to further that empowerment further those learning opportunities which is in itself outside of pay but so incredibly valuable so have we seen anyone else starting to integrate those kind of you know softer skills and and um you know equipment for their employees at all uh, in your experience yeah so so um yeah organizations do have those materials to, to help people um the question is then have people got the time then to access those materials to to devote the time to to those and are they under the same pressures that we've just highlighted around well-being, the root causes of well-being, you know, ineffective systems and processes, um, having to pick up um, the backlog, people leaving the organisation and, and filling for those and doing the day-to-day -day job. The materials are there, but have they got the time available to then access those materials and give them justice and, and learn from is the question back. But yes, definitely have those materials in place, but think about just, just giving people the time to, to learn and develop. Um, but one question I had in an organisation once that sort of aligns to that is, they set utilisation rates for their people at 95%. Um, and, and then 10 or 15% of the time was spent in internal meetings. Those two things don't stack up. Where was the time to learn and develop and, and sit down and do self-learning or coaching or whatever it might be? Because you know, if you want to do those things, you know, that organization as a temple must would have had to set utilization utilization rate down to 50%, internal meetings at 15% to allow X percent then to, to do self-learning and career development stuff um, and coaching. Yeah. So you're almost safeguarding that time to actually yeah, invest the in time, yourself. Yeah. yeah, exactly. So yeah, seeing it come through, but actually carving out that time to actually be efficient and actually do and utilise those toolkits yeah, and you, as important. Utilisation rates for, for the least senior people are often much higher than the more senior people, if we're talking in those terms, but it's the, mm -hmm. the least senior people in an organisation that might need the most time to learn and develop. Yeah, that's where we're getting value, isn't it? We're talking value. That's the crux of it, what you get from it. So brilliant. OK, then we'll just do one last one then that we've just had in from Sam. And um, so saying in terms of well-being, is there a trend of what it is that leaders feel are missing? So, you know, are there specific things that we can put our fingers on? Is it culture, relationships, opportunities, those kind of things? Have we seen trends? Yeah, yeah. So the, the main trend is pre-pandemic when people maybe had more people working in teams is that those inefficiencies in systems and processes and bureaucracy were sort of worked around by just having more people doing the job. As soon as we've had fewer people in teams, all the, the holes and, and the rifts and things and inefficiencies of those systems and processes have been flagged because now you haven't got the manpower to, to work around those. And, and just do that Excel sheet because there isn't a digital system in place. As soon as you've got fewer people, then it's just highlighted how inefficient um, all those old systems and processes were. So if we want to work in a world where we've got fewer people in a team, we need to then drastically increase the efficiency of the systems and processes that we've got in place to actually help people do the job rather than hold them back. And a lot of the people themselves are saying, I'm having to work these long hours because a lot of the time is, is spent doing things I shouldn't need to do, you know, accessing three systems instead of one system, doing multiple sign-ons instead of a single sign-on. 
on to work in Excel where there must be an app or something out there. Well, all these things add up and why am I having to work these longer hours? Um, and the other thing just quickly on that one is hybrid working. People working from home don't have the commute, but have often filled in the commute time with additional work time as well, which is added to the problem. Yeah, 100 percent. So actually, that then feeds back into the point we were saying earlier, wasn't it? About, yes, this is my pay, but what do I have to do for that pay? Exactly. Yeah. exactly. Brilliant. OK, then. So I think that's it for the questions in our uh, Q&A. So I will close out by just thanking everyone for coming along and sharing that with us. Like I said, the recording will be shared with you directly afterwards and will be available on our platforms. So really hope that you manage to take some good tangible insights out of that and um, yeah thank you for coming along the journey with us as we continue to ask ourselves we'll pay, make them stay but uh we shall review so thank you very much and i bid you all a wonderful thursday and say see you later thank you everybody Bye -bye. bye